carpet was my first fish that I caught on the fly. And the first thing that she said was like, okay, daddy, but I want to go hunt chicken. Dude, I hit it twice. I know I did because I saw feathers come off it both times. I watched that bird fly like a good four or five hundred yards before it finally fell. Cow, cow, bull. And so as soon as I saw the bull, I just squeezed the trigger and it was like a perfect shot. Welcome to Wildlife Outdoors with your host, Russell and Jose. If you have a passion for conservation of the outdoors or you're enjoying a calming hike in the mountains, an exhilarating kayak trip on the river, feeling a fish on the end of your line, cooking on an open flame in a primitive campsite, or stalking big game, just waiting for the perfect shot, you're in the right place. So put on your boots and polarized sunglasses and come along for the ride. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of the Wildlife Outdoor Podcast. My name is Jose, and of course, we have the other host, Russell. And today, we are joined by Dr. Emily Belser. She is uh, an old co- friend and colleague of mine from the Kingsville days, if you will. She received her PhD in wildlife sciences, and currently, she is a consulting biologist, and she is in land sales as well. So thank you, Emily, for joining us today. We appreciate it. Thanks for having me. And in addition to all those things, she is also an accomplished uh, outdoors woman. She's um, actually just came back not too long ago from a trip in Africa, which we're going to talk about because those pictures looked awesome. And then she's also um, gotten into fly fishing and things too. And and so we'd love to hear more about your adventures in that because I think you went to Belize in one of your trips, didn't you? I did. I've been twice. Dang. That's pretty neat. That's that a awesome. that's like a life goal of mine. Yeah, <laughs> it's a good goal. You should go. Yeah, sure. I've only heard good things. Like every person I ever talked to, like, yeah, man, you got to go. You got to do it. There's so many places in Central and South America that I want to go, or like anywhere on the the Western Caribbean. Like, I just want to go for one for vacation, but just all the different species that you can catch down there. Like, oh, that's yeah. definitely. The um, <laughs> have y'all seen the videos of people? Um, fly fishing for rooster fish off the beach. Yes. Yeah. Oh my gosh, it looks so intense, but I want to try it so bad. Oh, <laughs> it looks like a blast. I got I to gotta practice a lot. First. <laughs> oh, for sure. Yeah. I don't remember who it was, but I believe it may have been Yeti. But somebody made a a, a short film on fly fishing for rooster fish uh, from the beach. I believe in Baja, and it looked intense. But not only is it a skill set. Like you have to be in physical shape too, because they're yeah. basically sprinting down the beach to try to find them whenever you see the fence. Like it's, it's crazy. I want to do it so bad. Though. And your casting has to be on point because you get like one shot at these fish. whenever yep. you do see Yeah. Them. It's, insane. it's insane. And they're beautiful fish, dude. Oh my goodness. Yeah. They like, are really cool. Yeah. Nothing like them. I don't know. There's so many places to go and so little time and not enough money <laughs> Ain't that in true. a lot of cases. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so of all the species that you've caught, what, is the favorite one whether it be due to the fish the size or just the experience um definitely my permit that i caught on my last trip to belize for sure um so i went to belize a couple years ago with my sister it was a um it was like a women's fishing trip through orvis at the lodge you're staying at and so i I pretty much learned to fly fish there the guides there were amazing um they're really good with new beginner fly fishermen they're really good and patient at teaching you. Um, and so the first trip I caught bonefish and tarpon, which was awesome. But the my trip back, I really wanted a permit. So the first day, um, so we went back. It was like my entire family. It was so this past year, instead of doing Christmas gifts, we went to Belize. And That's awesome. So we went as a family, which was so cool. So the first day, my sister and I fished together. And we looked and looked for permit. We just we just couldn't get on any. Um, we were catching some bonefish, of course, uh, but no permit. Second day, we did like a big family day where we went out to the reef and did um, reef fishing. And then they cooked for us on the beach. It was really cool. Third day, my dad and I fished together. And I was after permit and permit only. <laughs> I didn't care about <laughs> bonefish. I, mean, I think I cast at some. We looked for tarpon, but... I was after for per, I was after permit. Didn't catch anything that day because that's all I wanted. My my poor dad. He was so patient. <laughs> <laughs> you know he did. He's not really into fly fishing, so he was just chilling on the boat with me. Um, and then finally the fourth day, my sister and I fished together again, and I still really wanted permit. We both did. We neither of us had caught a permit, 
and uh, she ended up not being able to catch one. So we got to go back, but I caught one. So, you know, I worked really hard for it. Um, you know, we cast it. I don't know how many permits. So that one day that my dad and I went out together, we saw a bunch of permit and I cast to a bunch of permit and they just, you know, I don't know if it was my casting or the fly, you know, they just weren't taking the flies that I had, you know, they're, they're tough to catch. Um, mm -hmm. And so when I finally caught one, it was, it was so much fun. Cause it, you know, he, my guide was fairly new. And so he was really, really excited for me. So that's, you know, when your guide is really into it and really excited, it gets you even more excited. Um, but yeah, it was an amazing experience. He put up a really good fight. Um, he took, he took it all the way to the backing. Like it was just like, zing. <laughs> that is awesome. It was so much fun. That's like the pinnacle of fly fishing. That's incredible. Yeah, it is. Yeah. So after four days of anticipation, like what is the feeling when you finally hook into one? Oh my gosh. It was amazing. Like I was so excited. Like I was hugging my guide. I was hugging my sister. <laughs> I was like jumping around. <laughs> and my guy, awesome. he got, he was so worked up that he took my rod and he got to the front of the boat. This is after we had released it. And uh, he was just like casting and stripping it back in and casting and stripping it back in <laughs> just to like release some of that energy because we, we were all excited. <laughs> Oh it my was gosh. A good day. That's so cool. So yeah. you said that was your second trip to Belize. So mm -hmm. on your first trip, that's where you pretty much learned to fly fish. Yeah. Um, I guess yeah. so since never having done that before, well maybe you have, but not to like the extent you're doing it there. What kind of spurred that that decision to go on that that Orvis sponsored fly fishing trip? It was all my sister. Um really? she's really into fly fishing. She's really gotten into it the past couple of years. And she and her husband had been out to the Bahamas and mm -hmm. were after bonefish. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that really made her want to try Belize because bonefish are not as much of a challenge. So you can really get a lot of practice. in. Mm -hmm. um, they're still a challenge, of course, but they're honest. They call them honest fish down there. Like if you present the fly correctly, they're going to take it. Whereas something like a permit, mm, they're pretty iffy. They may or may not take it, but. Um, but yeah, she got me into it. That's pretty cool. That is so, pretty cool. What, so what was that trip like? Having never really fly fished before and then going out and catching bonefish and tarpon, which are like a lot of dudes, a lot of people who have been doing this for a while have never caught either. And you go on your first trip and you get to catch both. Like, what is that? What was that like for you as a newcomer to the, to the sport? Yeah. So starting out, uh, especially the first day, I, I had taken a fly fishing lesson like mm -hmm. one afternoon. And I practiced it, practiced a little bit at the lodge the day before the first day we went out. And so the first day we were actually out on the boat, you're fighting a little bit of wind and I'm, I'm learning how to cast really. And there's fish and there, my guide is telling me, you know, 10 o'clock, 10 o'clock, cast now, cast now 50 feet. And I'm like, what, what, what? <laughs> like, <laughs> I, you know, I got frustrated and I was like, Elizabeth, you got to take a turn and I, you know, and so we'd trade off. So I would get really frustrated. Um, but, you know, I finally got the hang of it. The second day, actually, a tarpon was my first fish that I caught on the fly was the next day. Wow. Um, that was really fun. So did that ruin your fishing here in the States? Because, I mean, in comparison. <laughs> <laughs> I still, you know, I haven't um, been after redfish, you know, being in South Carolina. Um, I ended up getting a nine weight so I could go after redfish, but I haven't tried it yet. I need mm -hmm. to. Redfish are fun. Not like tarpon or yeah. bonefish, I imagine, but they're fun. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I've, I've never fished flood tides for slot reds. Um, yeah. I've only fished for bull. Well, I have fished for them. I've never caught them. The only redfish I've ever caught were bull reds down in Venice, Louisiana. And um, that's an absolute blast. And when you're talking about getting frustrated at the front of the boat, I 100% get that because the first trip that I made down to Venice, I hooked into a large fish and I was so nervous. I was shaking so much. I couldn't clear the line from the reel. I ended up like dropping my rod in the water, jumped off the front, oh. grabbed it. Like it was a whole thing. I ended up losing oh. the fish and I was shaking so much Dang. that I told my buddy, Brian, I said, dude, you, you got to go up there because I was just so wound up and I can't even imagine, you know, a tarpon or a bonefish. Like those are even higher on the ladder than a redfish. So yeah, I yeah. definitely understand what you mean by that. And, yeah. uh, it's it's a whole nother feeling for sure. But then again, I was somewhat experienced at fly fishing at that point. I couldn't imagine doing it like 
right off. <laughs> did you have a guide with you or did you? Yes. Go? Yeah. We were with a guide. So I don't know how your experience was, but the guides were in Belize, the place you're staying, like I said, they're really good with new fly fishermen. Mm -hmm. So they're constantly barking orders. I mean, they're very nice about it usually, but when they get excited, they're like yelling because <laughs> they're yeah. so excited. And it just like, it's, it's fun, but it also like, if you're already stressed out, you're like, give me just a minute. <laughs> I think it's a saltwater guide thing. They're just yeah. salty individuals. <laughs> and they don't mean anything mean. Yeah. But they're so helpful. Yeah, I've I've had the same experience. I've taken a few white river guides here in Arkansas and I've taken a few saltwater guides and it, the saltwater guides are just a whole other breed. They they're just a little bit more abrasive, but they don't have any malicious intent in anything, but sure. yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, especially when there's like tailing permit or like rolling tarpon, you know, they're getting excited, you know, they're yeah. not, they're in it cause they love it. And exactly. so they get almost as, ex as excited as you. And I mean, it makes it more fun. For sure. Cause I imagine like, I mean, those are big fish. So when you see them, I mean, it's gonna, it's gonna get you excited, but then usually you have like a finite amount of opportunities to kind of make it happen. Whereas, you know, if you're on the river fishing for trout, you're just throwing some nymphs or dries. It's like if you miss one, it's not that big of a deal. You know, there's going to be more. You know? So it's, it seems like it's much more high stakes. So it's just they just kind of have to be intense almost, it feels like. It is, yeah. That's pretty neat. So you've gone to Belize. Uh, where else would you like to go? Like what is the next trip for you? Uh, if, if you for If you find it out. Yes, yeah, for fishing. Um, honestly, I'm not sure. So – I'm kind of torn. <laughs> I got to make a little more money first, but I'm torn between going back to Africa and doing some fly fishing and a safari or going to Scotland and doing some fly fishing there and hunting for roe deer. So like, I really want to combine it with a hunting trip. Mm -hmm. Ideally. Yeah. That's awesome. Good to have goals. Right? Oh, for sure. Oh, always. <laughs> have you ever, um, what about New Zealand? New Zealand has pretty big hunting and fishing scene there, don't they? I think so, yeah. Big old stags and some nice rainbows. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I haven't looked into New Zealand a whole lot, but it does look cool. Yeah, New Zealand looks awesome. Actually, I think I have a friend, actually my coworker. She may, I can't remember if she said her and her husband went to New Zealand or they want to go to New Zealand. But she, I need to ask her tomorrow, actually. I forgot, but I think she. they know a couple from New Zealand and they do hunts out there. So I'm going to have to kind of pick a brain about it see how much it'd be to do one because that'd be that'd be awesome that's another bucket list thing of mine i think russell too yeah. didn't you say you want to go to new yeah, zealand dude i want to go to new zealand so bad i used to date a girl that her cousin he uh hiked the appalachian trail and it wasn't enough for him so he decided he was going to go spend three months in new zealand hiking from tip to tip and uh dude was a photographer too and just the pictures and some of the videos that he brought back like through the screen because he they he connected his camera to the tv when he got back and I was there for that. We watched everything. I was like, yeah, no, that's that's definitely on my list to go to. And then to find out they have massive freaking rainbows there. I'm like, that definitely needs to happen someday. That'd be a sweet trip. So speaking of Africa, you mentioned Africa earlier. Mm -hmm. How was your safari? How was your trip there? It was amazing, of course. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so it was actually my second time going to Africa. I had been to South Africa when I was in college my senior year, there was a, it was like a spring break study abroad class. So you basically went to class once a week. And then over spring break, we went to South Africa for two weeks and we got to travel all around South Africa. And we saw a lot of really cool stuff. Um, so, and I loved it. It was amazing. I've always wanted to go back. I had no idea that I would get to go back. Um, especially this trip was planned like within a week um, oh, wow. of knowing about it, basically. So I'd always wanted to go back, but I'd always wanted to go back on a hunting trip. And because my brother-in-law had been there and he, I think he was, did a scouting school or something um, when he was in the army like years ago. And so he had always also wanted to go back on a hunting trip. And so he and his friends had booked a trip. I think they've been planning it since last fall. They had it lined up. There were four of them going and um, like a week, literally a week before they were supposed to leave. One of his friends broke his leg and obviously wasn't able to go. And so my brother-in-law was scrambling, trying to find somebody that could go to Africa on a week's notice. 
<laughs> and uh, so he called me and, you know, fortunately I was able to, you know, push some things around with work and whatnot and I was able to go. So I feel very, very lucky. So that without, so cool. without that push, I don't know when I would have actually made the trip back. So what was the intention of the trip? Was it specifically to hunt a certain species or? Yes, it was. It was a hunting trip. Um, it was, so actually one of my brother-in-law's friends had won a safari, like the hunting safari at a Ducks Unlimited banquet. And oh, wow. so, yeah, for four. So he got a really good deal on it. And so we were all supposed to shoot uh, an impala, a wildebeest. So it could be a black or blue, a warthog. And the fourth one. Oh, a management animal. Um, so the management animal was going to be determined whenever we got there. It could be could have been an animal with a broken leg or maybe a sick one or something like that. And so those are the four that were on the list. And then, we, of course, you can always add on more animals. Um, so my brother-in-law and I hunted together the whole time. And he added a kudu, a baboon. A uh, zebra and uh, a nyala. I always, always mispronounce it, <laughs> but uh, and then I added on a steenbok and a gimsbok. Um, That's so cool. So yeah, so we had a goal going out there of the four animals and then a couple of add-ons, but I think our list changed a little bit once we got there. Hey, there's nothing wrong with that. <laughs> <laughs> right. So how long were y'all there in Africa for? So we landed on, we landed in Africa Sunday night. Our guide picked us up or our PH picked us up from the airport. And then we got to the lodge like 1 a.m. or something like that. And so we hunted Monday through Saturday and then flew out on Sunday. So it was like six days. Of oh, wow. What country were y'all in? South Africa? South Africa. Mm. Yeah. We were in the Limpopo province. Nice. So we we're pretty close, pretty close to Botswana. Mm -hmm. If you're familiar with the not really. <laughs> <laughs> I have uh, I've met people through over the years. Uh, one of my buddies is from Senegal. Uh, I had a guy I used to work with. It was from Togo and stuff. A lot of you know Western Africa and stuff. But uh, yeah, yeah, I'm not too familiar with with the countries or provinces there. So I do want to make a trip over there someday. At some point, I'll make it happen. Yeah. So what do you want to fish for over there? Uh, tiger fish. Oh, nice. that, that would be so cool. <laughs> would be. That'd be pretty epic. Those things have some crazy teeth. Yeah, yeah, they, they do. Really do. I actually know somebody that knows a guide over there. So, you? if you want to make a trip, I might okay. be able to connect you. Um, if I'm not mistaken, I believe the company's called African Waters, and okay. um, I'm not sure what country they're in. But um, actually, last week's catch of the week was a tiger fish caught in nice. Africa, nice. and um, by uh, Yako. So. Um, I might be able to connect some dots there and, and help you out if you decide to make that trip happen. Yeah, for sure. I wonder what even flies you'd have to throw at that thing. Like I imagine that to have like some bony jaws. Yeah. I don't even know. Yeah. That's crazy. Do you know what size yeah, rod that insane. dude used? I do not. I should have asked him though, but I would assume it'd have to be at least a 10, maybe a 12 weight. Like, I would think because that fish was big too. Yeah. 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 It was massive yeah. and using big old steel leaders. Yeah, and I think they live yeah. like in in uh, like faster currents too. So I imagine that would help them. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. What do I know? I don't know anything about tiger fish except that they got gnarly teeth. <laughs> <laughs> All I know is what you see on river monsters. So. Yeah, I don't know much about it either. But it looks cool. Yeah, yeah it does. that they do. So in Africa, what was the first game animal that y'all went after? Um. So the first game animal. Uh, my brother-in-law harvested a his wildebeest on the first day, and then I got my management animal, which ended up being a blessed buck. Um, it actually had a broken front leg, and it looked pretty fresh because when when I harvested him, you could it, the injury looked pretty fresh. Mm -hmm. uh, so that was the first animal that we went after. Was uh, did y'all get to try any of the meat while y'all were there? We did. Um, so we tried impala. So the, the lodge that we stayed at would cook some of what was harvested that day for supper every night. Uh, I think the first night was Impala stew. I know we had that one night. Um, I don't know what else we had. I wrote it down. 
<laughs> that off the top of my head, I can't quite remember. Uh, I think we had Wildebeest. Um, and uh, I don't think we had Kudu, but I've had Kudu um, the first time I was in Africa. And I remember that being really good. Um, yeah. But surprisingly, in my opinion, the best thing we had was zebra. They were zebra steaks. And uh, so before supper, the, the chef would always go up front and tell us what we were about to eat um, and explain everything, you know, this brown salad and whatever the meat was and so on. And so the night that we had zebra, he was like, no, I'm not going to tell you what this meat is until after supper. And we're like, okay. So we're all trying to guess what it is. And my brother-in-law was like, you know what, I bet it's zebra. Sure enough, it was. But it was delicious. It was tender. It was my That's favorite. awesome. I've actually had zebra myself as well. And I, mean, I would say that's probably one of my favorite meats. Yes. Um, Nogai is also another one of my favorite meats from a no guy that Jose harvested on the King Ranch. Yeah. And um, yeah, I'd say no guy and zebra are probably an axis deer is up there as well. But I've never had anything really too exotic. Um, yeah. But I can attest that yeah, zebra is really good. I used to date this girl that her, I guess, I don't know if her mom was married to the guy or if they were just dating, but he would just randomly get meat. And I wouldn't ask questions because he would have like lion and zebra and all sorts of crap. Wow. And he wasn't a wealthy guy either. So that's why it was kind of strange. Um, but somehow this man would get this meat and he cooked up some steaks one time and it, I wouldn't say it's an acquired taste, but it's a slightly different taste. Like I knew it wasn't like venison or beef or anything like that. Um, mm -hmm. but it was really good. And I asked him, I was like, what you season this with? And, you know, just trying to, you know, prod on what it was. And, oh, he's like, oh man, it's just zebra steaks that we just, you know, put salt and pepper on. I said, good to know. But it was, <laughs> it was one of my favorite meats. Yeah. And it's funny that he asked that question because that's exactly what I was thinking. I was like, I wonder which meats they ate and which one she liked the most. So what if, if you had to, I guess, compare it to something, what would you compare it to? Zebra? Yeah. I don't know. I don't know. I mean, it was just, it was so tender. And, really? Um, yeah. And it wasn't super game. Like it wasn't gamey at all. Um, I don't know. I really, I don't know what I would compare it to, but it was delicious. <laughs> Hmm. interesting and you said you had it just as steaks right yeah yeah, yeah. that's pretty cool i never would have thought of zebra being like good <laughs> I, don't, I don't know it is well you know some people eat horses yeah so that is true i'm not gonna lie and you might want to edit this out russell because we're probably gonna piss off some pita folks or something i don't know but i actually i was a friend of mine in kingsville he acquired some horse jerky somehow. Mm -hmm. I don't remember. I think it might have been like a like an old horse from one of his friends' ranches or something. And they turned some of it into jerky. And he offered me some. And I was very conflicted. Like I didn't want to, but curiosity got the better of me. I was like, I I, I don't know what I'm I gotta try it. And I was conflicted because it was so good. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it was really good. Um Maybe even better than like actual jerky. I don't know, but it was really good. And uh, yeah, I just, I, I didn't know how to feel about it. But if I, if given the chance, I would probably try it again. I'd like to try it. There's a, a beef jerky place here in Hot Springs downtown that has all sorts of exotic jerkies. And there's actually a place also in Paris, Texas. It's like Tex Best Smokehouse or something like that. And they have python jerky and alligator jerky and bison jerky <laughs> and and I, I like most jerkies. I will tell you that python and alligator jerky is not where it's at. They are both rough. Um, I can't imagine it would yeah, be. Yeah, there. It's just the and it's it's weird because whenever you eat python or alligator or and like I've eaten you know python, I've eaten pit vipers, like I've eaten all sorts all sorts of different snakes. I've never had this like almost swampy flavor, I guess. But in the jerky both the alligator and the python it was it, that's the only word that comes to mind is like swampy it's just it just tastes gross um but the the beef jerky place here in hot springs has kangaroo jerky and every time i've gone to get it they're sold out and i want to try and, and they have a sampler that has all these different things but the kangaroo jerky is not in there so you'd have to get the full size package and they never have it i forgot i have tried kangaroo jerky so really? yeah my in, in call station my friend and roommate he had a friend who moved to Australia 
with his girlfriend and he happened to come back into town and he brought several packets of kangaroo beef jerky. And I just happened, I was, I was out in town doing something. I just happened to get back whenever he was there and he had brought over the jerky and they had just cracked a bag. It goes, do you got to try it? So I tried it. It was really, really good. Really? It was phenomenal. Yeah. It was really good. Try There's it. a reason why it sold out, man. Like, it's yeah, really yeah. Good. <laughs> <laughs> I just assumed it was probably hard to come across, but uh, maybe it's just that good. And he was telling me, we started talking about it. He was like, yeah, dude, like in Australia, kangaroo meat's huge. Like apparently kangaroo steaks are fantastic as well. Like I, I never would have thought. They just look like a big rat with massive legs. I mean, right. I don't know. But yeah, apparently some good stuff. The jerky I can attest is fantastic. Never, I would try a steak if given a chance. Just never had. Yeah, I would think that the meat would probably be kind of tough. I would think, well, especially in the tail. Maybe not their legs so much, but I would think their tail meat would probably yeah. be tough because they use those a lot. Mm-hmm. But I'd, I'd be willing to try it. Beavers use their tails a lot too, and they're like super fatty. Really? Yeah, but. Side changes. We Russ and I do this a lot. We do. That's a why lot. we started the podcast in the first place because we would just randomly just go off on tangents, sitting at a bar talking about animals for three hours while our friends yeah. are sitting over yeah. there falling asleep. So <laughs> <laughs> that was kind of how the idea started. But um, we talked a little bit off the podcast, but I guess we can talk on the podcast. So you're saying that you got started in hunting at a young age with your your dad. You said I did. Yeah. Um, so I was pretty young, and dad would take me squirrel hunting. I was kind of what we did when I was really little because it was easy to follow him around. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, you're just walking through the woods. You don't have to be super quiet. You have to be a little bit quiet. But, yeah. Um, so I got into hunting that way. And then mm-hmm. when I got a little bit older, he started taking me deer hunting um, and turkey hunting. So my first deer hunt, um, he harvested a doe. And then, of course, the first turkey hunt, he got a turkey. And then it was over after that. I was after whatever else. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome but i started really really started getting into it i'm hoping to take my youngest hunting for the first time this year she uh it, just, it cracks me up so a couple of years ago uh we had lost one of her jackets and it was getting kind of cold outside and i took her to walmart and they had like no jackets in her size and the only jackets they had were slightly too big for her but they were like 80 dollars, and they were camo jackets and she really wanted it for some reason and I was like, well, I said, you got to promise me, though, if I get you this jacket, you're going to go hunting with me. And the first thing that she said was like, OK, daddy, but I want to go hunt chickens. <laughs> like, <laughs> we'll go hunt. But we're not going to hunt chickens. You don't just shoot chickens, you know. And she's like, but I want to. And she was like four. And um, she really wanted to go hunt chickens. And I tell her, all that, even to this day, she still says she wants to go hunt chickens. But I told her, I said, we'll go hunt deer. And so, like, if she sees a deer, whether it's in a mural or in real life or at a zoo or something, like, she'll say, Daddy, you want to shoot that deer? And it's it's adorable. But oh, I think I'm going to take her I squirrel hunting this fall. Um, and and I hope she enjoys it. But I'm kind of – she's so hyper, I don't really want to give her a twenty two, And I don't have an air rifle, but I have a regular pump uh, pellet gun. So I think I might just let her take that, even if she doesn't harvest anything. And then I'll probably harvest a couple squirrels. And um, she's a foodie just like me, so – um, hopefully getting her there with me, cleaning them and cooking them will kind of, you know, help feed that. So, but oh, yeah. she, uh, That's awesome. yeah, she's something else. She wants to hunt chickens. I mean, maybe I could take her to like Hawaii where there's like wild chickens or something someday. <laughs> you can go to Africa and shoot guineas. Ooh, that's oh, an idea. Yeah. I got two guineas around here at work that oh, I don't want to shoot them. They piss me off. <laughs> Is wing shooting like a big thing in Africa? Okay, so that's a really good question. So apparently it's not huge, but there are some outfitters that'll do it. Uh, When my brother-in-law and I were over there, we got to talking about it. And we asked our PH about um, if he could get us a shotgun and we could shoot. So there's doves everywhere. Like, it's wild. You just go sit sit at a watering hole and they're just everywhere. And guineas, too. There's guineas everywhere. And so, like, I was just itching to have a shotgun in my hands (laughs) because of all the doves. Um, unfortunately our pH couldn't get a shotgun for us in oh, time, man. but, but yeah, there are some outfitters that do it. I think, uh, some will, I think there's some duck hunting you can do. Um, in fact, uh, I didn't realize this, but apparently our, um, our tracker had a slingshot in his pocket the whole time. And so I think it was like maybe day three, day two or day three, uh, our pH and I had, uh, had gone to stalk an Impala 
And so my brother-in-law and the, our tracker stayed back and um, were hanging out. And Bobby said they were just sitting there in this, um, I don't, I think it was like a grouse or something on the, that was walking by. And the tracker pulled out his slingshot <laughs> and just like fired at this bird <laughs> on the ground. And he was like, where did this come from? And so later that night, Bobby told me what happened. I was like, dang, he's been holding out on me. I was like, now I really want to see him get a bird with his, his slingshot. That's but, uh, awesome. Yeah. That would be so cool. <laughs> I mean, could you imagine like killing a bird in Africa with a slingshot? Like that's that's, that's a story. Skill. For sure. <laughs> that would yeah, that would be a feat. For sure. My dad, so my dad's from Mexico. He grew up there, and uh, they weren't allowed to have you know Mexico's just totally different. Like in, in regards to firearm laws and stuff, they couldn't have any. But um, they ate a lot of wild game like quail and rabbits and stuff. But he would use a slingshot. He would go hunting on the mountain in a little hill, like just outside of, the, out of town with a little slingshot. He'd come back with rabbits, quail, all kinds of stuff. But it's, I mean, that's got to take some skill. I surely yeah. couldn't do that. It's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. That's <laughs> insane. Yeah, I've I've, uh, I've harvested animals with a blowgun before, <laughs> but never a slingshot. <laughs> that takes skill too. Yeah. Yeah, for yeah. sure. I, I will say that um, I was not um, doing it legally. I, this was before I really knew anything about regulations. I was I was younger. I was a kid, and uh, so don't criminate going to, yourself, Russell. Uh, I mean, it's a funny <laughs> story. And so I was going around the neighborhood shooting uh, dove with a blowgun. And I will say that dove are pretty resilient creatures. It took four darts for for me to harvest the first one, <laughs> and then I found I got smart and I was like, well, what happens is if I could shoot it through the wing, it can't fly off, and then I can go ahead and finish the process myself but uh the first three shots i got great shots right through the chest and that dove was just still flying from rooftop to rooftop i was like man this thing gonna die <laughs> dude your eurasian collar doves are tough yeah there was a uh so in south texas there's this organization called there, there's it was csa the challenge sportsmen of america and every year in October, I think it was in October, they would have a weekend dedicated to taking people with disabilities hunting and fishing. And the, I was part of an organization in my undergrad where we would go volunteer and we would help out. So if you're working with like the folks who are fishing, you were um, like baiting the hooks, taking the fish off, you know, tying things on, whatever, just, you know, make sure they're taken care of. If you were with the hunting party, you're essentially the bird dogs, like you made sure if they down anything, you'd go and get it and make sure their guns are loaded and make sure, you know, they're, they're cool, that they have water, all that stuff. But a lot of times, like they were just there to have a good time. Like they would, they would add, they would like give you a gun or ask if you want to hunt with them and you know, you can hunt with them. And, um, cause some people had like what are called able bodies, which are able bodied people to, you know, to be there. They're like their guests. You'd hunt with them or they, you know, they would be their bird dog, whatever, so to speak, and go and get the, get the birds for them. Um, if they didn't have an able body, sometimes we would be theirs for them. But the, dude, it was just a weekend of, I don't even know. It was just, it was just so much fun. They would, they would come from so far away and this is like their one time to kind of get out, you know, maybe for the year or at least for the end of that year, you know? And so then a lot of these people were, re were like repeat people. So they knew, like they knew each other. So they'd show up and there'd be a ton of beer that was donated. So it was like all you could drink. So these people were getting smashed, dude. <laughs> so like drinking to like three or four in the morning, getting up at six to go hunt. And they're like hunting, just totally hung over, if not still drunk. Like it's in <laughs> insane. And, uh, same thing in the night and they're just there to have fun, man. It was, it was, it was a good time. But anyways, we we're there and I, um, I, I was with my buddy. I was his able body, but I didn't bring a shotgun with me. So one of the guys that me brought his was a little over under 20 gauge. And there was this Eurasian, like just kind of fluttering above me. Dude, I hit it twice. I know I did because I saw feathers come off it both times. I watched that bird fly like a good four or five hundred yards before it finally fell. And it fell across the canal. Like they flew across the canal and fell on the field. I was like, dude, there's no way I'm getting that bird. So I didn't even yeah. try to go and find it. But those things were tough. Yep. They can take some lead, man. It's insane. Yeah, I've shot a couple Eurasian collar doves out there at Dalen's place in San Marcos. And yeah, I mean, they because they would fly right over his house. We'd sit in his front yard. And we'd shoot out to his pasture because he had 100 acres out there. And so they'd fly over his house and then we'd just shoot as they were flying out. And uh, so it was flying low and I hit it and just feathers went everywhere and it just kept flying like nothing. I put another shell, hit it again, feathers flew everywhere. And it was just, it's kind of slowed down a little bit after the second shot. And then it went and it made it all the way into that trailer park that was, you know, past his property. 
and landed somewhere in there and I was like, I'm not going to go walk around there looking for it. But I was like, my goodness, every, every, you know, white wing that I shot would fall. And that one was just, it just kept on going. Yeah. Eurasians are crazy, man. Yeah, they are. <clears throat> so Emily, um, I see that you have a bird dog in your lap. <laughs> <laughs> this is Winston. <laughs> is he a Cocker Spaniel? He is. Yeah. That's I got him awesome. when I was living in Texas. Nice. So are you, are you big into bird hunting? Um, I try to be. I don't get to go <laughs> often enough, but yeah, I do really enjoy it. Did you get to go while you were in South Texas? I did. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah, I did a good bit of dove hunting, a little bit of quail. Yeah, the, in Kingsville. So Kingsville, that's where you, you went for your PhD. It's a small small-ish rural town south texas um but south texas for whatever reason is like the dove capital of the world i guess like everybody well i guess that's not true argentina probably would be the dove capital of yeah. the world <laughs> <laughs> maybe the dove capital of the united states um but yeah a lot of people go down south for dove hunting and it was awesome i i loved dove hunting while i was down south it was it was a good time duck hunting too um honestly as much I don't get to go deer hunting at all. Um, admittedly, I love to do it when I can, and maybe that's why I've grown to have an affinity for for uh, bird hunting. But I just love bird hunting. I don't know what it is about it, like doves, ducks, especially if you go with like a duck dog or or, or have a bird dog. It's just so much fun to watch them work. Yeah. Like oh, it is. Yeah, that's my favorite part of quail hunting. Like I don't even yeah. have to have a shotgun in my hands. Like I just enjoy watching the dogs work. It's that's pretty neat. Really- really cool is that uh, uh did, did winston ever get to go hunting with you in south texas he did a little bit yeah. um i'm not the best dog trainer but we tried <laughs> <laughs> he's more of a couch potato now <laughs> he's mad at me because we've been in the office all day <laughs> <laughs> so you might have to edit out some lines or <laughs> pouting in the back <laughs> It'll make the scene. I'll leave him in. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we did a, we did an episode with a guy a while back. His name is Grant. Really cool dude. He, um, he rescued a cat on the Guadalupe river and they were doing a fly fishing trip and they were on a raft in the middle of the river and this little cat was it, was it the Guadalupe? Yeah. Yes, he, named Guadalupe. It. Yeah. Yep. he named it Lupe, I think. Right. Yep. But yeah. So he, they, they found a little kitten in the river they were, they saved it and they took it home and they raised it and they still got it. But we we're doing an episode and that little cat just made a guest appearance. And uh yeah. So yeah, we're I mean we're animal lovers here. So Winston's more than welcome to hang out. <laughs> we did another one. Wasn't it Zach Harris where he has a deaf cat that made this weird noise? Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that cat I was pretty interesting. <laughs> so we are definitely animal lovers on here. <laughs> oh man, that's hilarious. And unfortunately, I think neither of us have pets. So, <laughs> gotta get a dog. Yeah, this is the first time in my entire life that I've never had pets. At one point, we had 48 pets. And what? Now, yeah, dude. I, you, you, so, I've never talked to you about that? I don't think so. That's the first dude. I heard of it. So, when we were living in Arizona, we had, I mean, cats, dogs, salamanders, iguanas, hedgehogs, rats, snakes, uh, turtles, fish. And, and when I count 48 pets, I don't count like the frogs and the fish. And like one tank would be you know, one pet. Um, but yeah, dude, we had all sorts of things. We had hedgehogs that we thought were both females and then we had eight hedgehogs. Um, <laughs> so it's just, it's, it's, we had a lot of pets and it was strange because a lot of them were indoor pets other than the dogs and the cats, they were indoor outdoor. Um, but yeah, no, we, we had basically a small zoo <laughs> that was when I was younger. And then we had a bunch of dogs when I was in my like early teen years. And then in my adult life, I've always had dogs and or fish and cats. Um, but I yeah, currently do not have any pets. And it is very strange. It's been a few years since I've had an animal. So I haven't had a pet since high school. My uh, girlfriend at the time, her dad gave me a blue healer. I named him Bo. And I love that little puppy. And um, I was working in... I was working in Maynard that summer. So while I was, and it's like an hour and a half drive, about an hour from where I was at that time. And um, I'd get home late and my nephew, he, uh, he was there all the time. So I was paying him every week to, you know, watch the dog for me while I was uh, away at work and you just take him out and make sure he's all good. And 
he was living with my grandma and grandpa at the time. That's was I. So, you know, he was there. But um, my grandma and grandpa had to go somewhere. And they couldn't leave him alone because he was like four or five at the time, I think. So he went with them. But they didn't want to leave the dog inside. So they had like a little house outside with a gate. Had shade, water, all that stuff. He was fine. But he was whining a lot because that was his first time that he was ever really left alone. And so I remember I got home from work. And my grandpa met me in the driveway. I was like, oh, man, this is not good. And uh, the first thing he said to me was like, don't be mad. I was like, okay. He goes, we had to go somewhere. We took Bubba. That's my nephew. His name is James, but I call him Bubba. And uh, we took Bubba. And we put the dog outside while we were gone. When we got back, he wasn't there. So they think somebody stole him. Either they, either somebody stole him or they called um, – animal control and they came and got him but a few weeks later my grandma ended up finding his collar in the yard somewhere and it was cut and so i told myself ever since like that day i was like i'm not gonna get another dog unless you know i can take care of it and so i've just never been in a place where it was like a good time for me to have a pet you know um just because like grad school super busy and um also, places I lived didn't really allow pets. Uh, so it just, it just never worked out. Um, that being said, now that I'm here, I'm making more money than I did as a grad student. So I can maybe afford some pet bills if I need, to, if I need to pay those. <laughs> I feel like I'm in a place where I could. Um, I need to talk to the landowner to see if they will allow me to have pets because they have some goats and like they raise show goats. And, uh, obviously I don't want to. Um, if it's going to bother them or inconvenience them, I don't, I don't, I don't want to do that to them because they're being nice enough to rent, rent out this place to me. But if they'll allow it, man, I would, I would really love to have a dog. It's been a long time. And I've been wanting a lab. Actually, I've also been wanting a Cocker Spaniel for a long time. Those two are like my tops. Um, I just really want like a hunting breed dog. And, uh, yeah, hopefully soon. We'll see. I got to talk to them first. Yeah. You got to get one. They're great companions. They are. Oh, I bet. My, uh, and and so when I when I got into dove hunting and dove hunting in South Texas, I met a, a group of dudes, really good dudes. One of the guys, he ended up buying a black lab. He named. Did you ever watch the uh, that show Duck Dynasty? Mm-hmm. Okay, yeah. so you remember Cy, right? The old man who always had his glass of sweet tea. <laughs> he was like he was like our favorite. We would actually have watch parties whenever the new episodes came on. <laughs> and so um so we'd go, we'd hang out, but he was like our favorite. He ended up naming his dog Sai after that dude. And uh he was a great dog. He um he was the one that that kind of convinced me that, you know, I should get a black lab. Like he was the best. He was awesome. And so I would I I really would like um a black lab or chocolate lab, but uh, definitely a lab. Yeah. But we'll see. But it's just Labs like, it's such a, dog. yeah, but to train them, it's like such an investment in time, yeah. you know, and that's what I would kind of be worried about is just being able to train them properly. Cause I don't know shit about training dogs, part of my language, but yeah, I don't want to, <laughs> I don't want to teach them bad things or bad habits. Yeah. If I were to get a dog for hunting and or companionship, it would be either be between if money wasn't an option. A uh, Vishla, a Weimaraner, or a Nova Scotia Duck Toller. Um, the only reason why Dude. I would say no to the Nova Scotia Duck Toller is because they're like 10 grand dogs. But uh, All those dogs yeah. sound bougie. Dude, they're freaking, <laughs> they're very athletic and very intelligent dogs. Weimaraners are just awesome. A Vishla? Yeah, what was that one? What, what, what is so that? They're, they're a short-haired, hypoallergenic, streamlined bird dog. Um, very fast, very intelligent, very loyal. Uh, but they're also good with kids. They're not like, like, you know, some, some breeds are, are good specifically for hunting, but they're not great companion dogs and kids pulling on their ears are not a good thing. Uh, Vichelas are not like that. Weimaraners are very similar to, uh, Weimaraners temperament is very similar to that of a lab, but they're a little bit more intelligent, a little less playful. Um, but they'd also don't shed as much as a lab does because labs shed like crazy. And then mm-hmm. Nova Scotia duck tollers have their name because they are just amazing duck dogs. They have webbed feet. They're smaller. I think their max size is about 30 pounds. Um, and they they look similar to that of like a uh, Australian Shepherd. So, <laughs> but they're they're all three dogs are, are very good hunting dogs. Um, but they're all three pretty expensive dogs. <laughs> <laughs> they sound expensive. A yeah. Vishla, where does that come from? Is that like Italian? 
I really don't know where they originate from, but it sounds Spanish? like it probably be somewhere over there. Yeah, Spain, something like that. Yeah, European, maybe. some sort. Look it up. Hmm. So, how long have you had uh, Winston? Um, seven and a half years. Dang, that's cool. Yeah, so he was with me in Texas. We uh-huh. moved to Georgia together, and now we moved back to South Carolina together. He's well traveled more than me. Yeah, he is. <laughs> well, buddy. <laughs> that's awesome was it was what's the most challenging part about training a dog for i guess for hunting um honestly for me the learning curve because I'm, I'm there's still a lot i don't know and winston is not well trained so i might not be the best person to ask <laughs> <laughs> but um in general i think cockers are fairly easy to train so are labs mm-hmm. um and both of those breeds are very good with kids you know they're good with people for the most part the he's a field bred english cocker i think like the american ones can be kind of snippy but um but yeah he's he's really good with people what is uh what does field bred mean um so he's bred versus like a regular like he's bred to um have a lot of drive a lot of energy (laughs) he has a good nose his hair is a little bit shorter than your traditional um, English cocker. Um, so yeah, he's bred to, to, be, to hunt. That's so awesome. do you, do you have to like, uh, I guess take him out for exercise every day or does he get destructive when he doesn't release his energy? Um, he's not very, he's never really torn up anything around the house. Um, yeah. the only thing he throws up would be like the stuffed animal. <laughs> dog yeah. he, he'll rip one of those apart in like a minute. Um, so we don't get those anymore, yeah. but, uh, no, he's never really destroyed the house. Um, he definitely, so I just got him fixed last year, um, cause you're we having some issues. And so ever since then he's slowed down a lot, but he still has a lot of energy. He can go from zero to a hundred pretty quick. Um, <laughs> so, so I do try to exercise him a little bit, but he's gotten a little chunky here lately. <laughs> <laughs> Uh yeah, me too. I feel that. <laughs> <laughs> hey, it happens with age. <laughs> hey, me, me and Winston got that in common. <laughs> has That's he awesome. uh has he ever been fishing with you? Like has he been on a boat or anything? He has, um, especially in the past year or so. Um he's been on the boat a lot. Um yeah. I don't think he's ever been fishing with me. Um hmm. But yeah, he loves to go on the boat. He loves to go for a ride. He loves to be in the water. He loves to go swimming. That's yeah. awesome. That's so cool. Yeah, I looked up a Vishla. They are from Hungary. So <laughs> they're, they're called Hungarian pointers over there. And it's actually one of the most popular gun dogs in Britain at this point. So Really? It says they're uh, bred specifically for hunting, pointing, and retrieving in Britain. So Never heard of a Vishla before. Dude, That's pretty awesome. cool. I've known a few people that have had them. And the first one I saw was actually down in, I think, uh, Port Aransas. And this dog had so much energy. And the guy had one of those orange kind of like decoy training toys. And he mm-hmm. was chunking it as far as he could. And this dog would clear. Like right where the foam starts coming up on the beach, it would start jump from there on the sand. And it would like clear the first wave. I mean, just hauling. Super athletic dog. Have y'all seen those uh, those uh, Doug jump, or sorry, dog jumping competitions? Yeah. Like, dude, it's like those, those long things. <laughs> It's insane how far the, the dogs can jump. It's crazy. Yeah. Like 30 feet and crabs. Like, oh my God, how does that even happen? <laughs> yeah, I keep saying I want to enter Winston into one because he'll jump off the dock at the lake. Like, he'll run and jump. He jumps pretty far, but as far as the discipline side of it, we'd have to work on it. So he's got a good, good jump. <laughs> I used to have a Catahoula that I had that problem with. <laughs> he was a great dog, but he had a mind of his own. It's have you, it's a little bit off topic, but kind of related in uh in Buda, where Russ and I close to where Russ and I are, are from, uh well, I guess to some degree, our hometowns, I guess, if you will. Yeah. Um, they have weenie dog races. And so <laughs> <laughs> But some of these weenie dogs do they're they look more like sausages, they're huge, yeah. like little nubby legs. <laughs> I mean, but they'll they'll get at it. It's so funny to watch them go. I don't it know if is. they still do it. They used they used to have it every year. I don't know if they still do, but that was, that was a lot of fun to watch too. Yeah, dude, I haven't been to that in years. Like probably like yeah. high school. <laughs> it was so fun to go to. 
Yeah, it was like a big like carnival, I guess. Yeah. They would have, have like, like rides and games. And stuff. Yeah. yeah, it was a big thing. And then uh, I remember when Cabela's in Buda first opened up, like every weekend they were having all kinds of stuff. They would have those um, long jump competitions with dogs. And I mean, they were going like, I don't even know, 20, 30 feet. It was maybe even more. It was insane how yeah. athletic these dogs can be. It's wild. Yeah, it's freaking insane. But I mean, maybe we'd be the same if we had four legs that we ran on. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Have you ever seen those uh, those agility courses? <laughs> oh, dude, those things are cool. I like watching bloopers. <laughs> I saw one with I think it was like a Pomeranian. I think, really? dude, that little thing was moving. Yeah, it was in the. There was like this little little. I don't even know. I guess like a seesaw almost. But it was so light. He would like go to the very edge and it would fall so slow <laughs> and then he would take off again. But man, he was, he was moving pretty good. It was impressive. Dude, that's fast, cool. fast little dogs. I like watching the ones that are goofy and like will randomly like as they're going through like the zigzag <laughs> track and like grab the things and like just start, they're just being a pup, you know, it's, it's adorable to see. Get like a professional setting. Yeah. <laughs> it's normally last to do it. <laughs> yeah. 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 It's fun though. I mean, those dogs are discipline like i don't even know how you would begin to train for something like that probably lots of treats mm-hmm. i would assume so would be my guess yeah yeah want to use affirmative stuff not punishment yeah no. my, don't we um ben wooster didn't he mm-hmm. he was telling us about a book yeah about, there's a um, book about training he said it came out in the 70s or something about training yeah. dogs yeah but uh but that was like their big thing it was more like a i guess affirmative training not really disciplinarian like you mm-hmm. know just kind of um training your dog without using like shock collars and like physical discipline it was pretty interesting i can't remember what it's called though i'll have to reach, have yeah. to reach out to him yeah but he's like yeah dude like every person who trains dogs should read this book yeah. and we forgot so i gotta ask him about it <laughs> yeah I, I have the link i actually found found one of the books online um but I never bought it and it was on eBay, so it might not be there anymore. But I do have mm. the title saved somewhere on my phone. So I can send it to you if that's something you're interested in. <laughs> <laughs> or I'll put it in the link in the description. So Yeah. You know. Okay, Emily. I have one more question. Would you mind telling Russell and I about that nail guy? <laughs> <laughs> that guy. Yeah. That guy, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that was actually a really fun hunt as well. So I had just started working with Texas Parks and Wildlife and we had, it was like our district had a big meeting Mm -hmm. um, and we had to draw names and a hat to go hunting for no guys because they only would let just a couple of us go. So we had, so just a few of us had the opportunity one evening um, to go shoot no guy. And so, I think it was me and three other guys names got drawn. So it was only four of us out of, I don't know, maybe 20. Um, So super lucky, first of all, to even be able to get to go. And so um, it was me and another hunter in the truck with our guide. And um, so we drove out to the ranch and I remember him saying, you know, um, we'll look for some bulls first, but if we can't find a bull, you know, you can definitely shoot a cow. Um, But if you shoot a bull, we we do want you to mount it. Uh, which was fine with me Um, because, you know, when else would I ever have the opportunity? So that's kind of, you know, it's not a super common hunt. Um, So anyways, you're riding around and we saw a bull and it just took off. Like as soon as we saw it, it saw us and just took off and he disappeared in the brush and we're like, dang. So we drove around a little bit longer. It was getting a little bit later and um, the other hunters decided, he was like, you know what? We hadn't seen any other bulls. I'll shoot a cow if we come across one. And so the way that we were hunting, we were riding around in a truck in the sand dunes in South Texas. If you'll, um, so south, way south of Kingsville. And uh, I remember we saw a herd of cows. And so our guide basically races across the sand dunes and like whips the truck around so that the hunter can get his gun out. And um, he said, he told us, you're, you're going to have to shoot them while they're running. So basically, you're looking through the scope of a 308. I think it was, no, it was a 300 wind mag. And so you're looking through the scope. And he said, as soon as you see the animal in the scope, pull the trigger. It's like, okay, got it. 
And um, and he did. He he pulled the trigger. She he knocked her down. He ended up having to um, shoot her one more time. And uh, but yeah, it was it was really cool and exciting. You know, it's very different than what I'm used to. I'm used to sitting in a deer stand and waiting for the deer to come out, and you you know you take your time on your shot. And uh, so, anyways, after that, I was like, man, that was really cool. I still really want a bull, but you know, I, I'll take a cow if we if that's what we come across next. So we drive around, it's getting really late. We don't see any cows, we don't see any bulls. And our guide is like, all right, in this pasture, we're gonna check this one pasture before we head home. It's starting to get a little dark. Um, he's like, I know this one bull has been in this pasture for a while. Um, so we're gonna go see if he's there. And so we pull into the pasture and um, there he is, but he's in a herd of like seven or eight cows. Like it was a, a it was a lot of animals in the herd. And of course they're used to this kind of hunting. So as soon as they see the truck, they just take off running. And so he was like, all right, they're going to run down. They're going to hit a fence. Uh, it's a low fence, but they're going to hit that fence and they're going to turn back the other way. I'm like, okay. So we take off across the sand dunes and sure enough, they, they ran into the fence and then turn and headed down the fence. And um, he's like, all right, get ready, get ready. And he turns the truck around and I put the rifle up. And I'm looking through the scope and I just see cow, cow, bull. And so as soon as I saw the bull, I just squeezed the trigger and it was like a perfect shot in the neck, dropped him, never got up again. Like even the guide was like, it, like I was saying before with the fishing, you know, when your guide gets excited, like it really, you get even more excited. And he was really excited. Like he was like, that was an awesome shot. So that is awesome. it, it was a really cool hunt. That's so cool. Yeah. And it's a beautiful bull too. Well, thank you. Thank you. It is. I'm assuming that you ate that. I did. Yes. What do you think about the meat? Yeah, I really like no guy. It's um, it's not gamey mm-hmm. at all to me. It's it's really tender to me. Honest, I, I like it better than white yep. tail. Oh, yeah. um, it's it's really. I good. agree with that as well. Jose had the opportunity to get one, and he gave me some meat, and it was it's up there. It's definitely in my top five. Yeah. Yeah, and the the size of the animals. I mean, they're just they're huge. Yeah. I mean, you can see them compared to the white tail. I mean, that's not a bad white tail, but <laughs> it, it makes them look little. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, they're such funky animals. Like the way they run, and like I don't know, they're just they're just weird looking. They're odd. They are. They are. Did you want to talk about your hunt with one, Jose? Uh, yeah, sure. So I got really fortunate um, in Kingsville. There was like a Plan ID team, and. They ended up getting a free no guy hunt donated by the King of Ranch. And um, my friend's dad ended up winning that hunt. But the problem was, I guess it wasn't really a problem, but I get, well, one of the stipulations was that you had to find a way to process like everything. I mean, they could process it for you um, or they would take it to the, to the, to the shop to get it processed for you, but it would be, I don't even know, like five, $600, whatever it was, depending on what you wanted. And so my friend's dad didn't really like feel like dealing with all that. So he gave the hunt to his son and he was trying to figure out what he was going to do with it. And then he's like, he called me, he goes, Hey man. So my dad won this hunt, but it's just like logistically, like he just doesn't want to deal with it. So he gave it to me. I really want to do it, but I don't think I'm in a position to do it right now. So that being said, I'm calling you because I know that this is something you want that you'd like to do. And if you think you can figure it out, you can have the hunt. But if not, let me know so I can ask somebody else. Like, nah, dude, I'll figure it out. And I didn't know what to do, but it's like, how, when else am I going to have a chance to hunt a no guy? You know, like, especially for free. It's just, it's just not going to happen. So, I was talking to a buddy, some friends of mine one day, and he happens to have a ranch out in Del Rio. They do hunts and stuff. And so they process a lot of their own meat. So like, dude, just bring the nail guy to my house. And we'll, we'll take care of it. We'll grind it. He goes, I mean, we don't have any, like, uh, any fat to mix in with it. So it's just going to be, you know, it's just going to be no guy meat, you know, ground and steaks and whatever. It's not going to be anything fancy. I was like, dude, that's fine. I don't care. Like, let's do it. So. I reached out to the guide who also happens to be a friend of mine. I didn't know he was going to be the guide for that trip and kind of explained to him the situation. He goes, yeah, man, that's fine. Like as long as everybody's cool with it, I'll take you. I was like, all right, sweet. So we went, we set a day, we went out and we went to the Norias division, which is out by Port Mansfield. And, um, 
it's kind of the same, like exactly what you described is, is what my experience was. Like we just drove around the ranch in a truck and we just would stop at a couple spots and we would, we would, um, we would, uh, look for no guy and we would glass and everything. And we pulled up to these dunes and we parked on top of, on top of this little hill. And we stopped and we were glassing and he's like, man, I see one, but it's, it looks like it might be, you know, on the going towards the neighbor's side. And I saw a no guy. I thought we were looking at the same one. I was like, yeah, man, I see one too, but can't tell how far he is. And he looks, he goes, dude, there's one like a hundred yards from us. Let's go. So I had to use his gun. I didn't, the biggest gun I had at the time was a 270. And so he, I mean, he's been guiding on the King Ranch for a while and he, he gets all manners of folks, you know, people who are great shots, people who are new to hunting and stuff. So he doesn't really feel, from what he explained to me, he doesn't really, really feel comfortable. Um, people who have never hunted no guy to use anything less than like a seven mag, which is what he had that day. And so that's what I used. And, um, so we grabbed it. He grabbed the shooting sticks and we started kind of going, going up this little dune. And we saw the nail guy on the other side. He kind of walked down and we lost him in a, on to another dune. So we just started running. So we we're going up and down these dunes. We finally came up one and we saw him again. He popped out about 160 yards away and there's a little mesquite bush in front of us or in front of him. And uh, so he got up on the shooting sticks. I'm like, I'm out of breath from running. And then my adrenaline's gone. So that rifle's moving a lot. But finally, like I get the crosshair settled. I rip a shot. And I hit it and he takes off. So I, I put another round in the chamber and my guy and the guy's like, dude, shoot it again. And I'm running or and I, so I'm trying to lead it and I see it stop and it starts stumbling and just keels over. And so we're just like hugging and like just, just freaking out on top of the sand, dude. And so we get back to the truck and we drive over there and it was, I had never been that close to an animal that size. It was insane. Like I've, my biggest animal up to that point that I harvested myself was a white tail that was like maybe a hundred pounds because it's a little hill country deer. But dude, this thing was huge. And we, uh, he had to use a winch to load it up on the truck. We took it back. And so we weighed it. They had a, they had a scale, <clears throat> I think, if I remember correctly, dressed. It came out to about 308 pounds, I think. Something like that. It wasn't, and also to be fair, it wasn't a mature bull. So he gave me that option. He's like, we can, we can hunt for a mature bull if you want. There's no guarantee that you're going to get anything. Um, and I was like, dude, this is, this is like a once in a lifetime opportunity for me. <clears throat> I'm not going to be picky. Whatever opportunity we got, I'll take. It don't matter to me. And, uh, and so we came across that bull. And so he was a, a younger bull, but, um, man, he was beautiful. And so, yeah, we uh, we went out to lunch afterwards, came back, loaded the animal up, and then I went to my buddy's place in uh, in uh, Rivera, and we spent the rest of the afternoon processing it. I think I got to his house at four in the afternoon, didn't finish till midnight, and there was four of us working on that animal. It was it just took forever, but we had like two big coolers full of meat, and so I gave them some for helping. I gave some to my friend, his dad, for giving me the hunt. And uh, I, when I got back home, I think I gave Russell some, I gave my family some, gave some mm -hmm. other people some, and I still had a ton left over. And I was just kind of like <laughs> living off. But yeah, that was one of the coolest experiences I've ever had. And it is some of the best game meat I think I've ever had. It was so good. And, um, you know, hopefully if all goes well, it's uh, another hunt that I'd like to go on again someday. But this time I want to do it with a bow. So that's going to be like... That's like another, I guess, lifer for me. I would love, really, I'd yeah. like to try to do it public land because I know, like now in Texas, you can apply for those those permits um, on some wildlife refuges and down south. So I'd really like to try to get a public land no guy with a bow. That'd be that's like, I guess, the pinnacle for Texas hunting for me at this point in yeah. time. But yeah, that'd be that'd be sweet. Dude, that would be an insanely difficult hunt, though. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I would. I got to start shooting my cool. bow. Well, I guess we're getting up on time. Um, we are, I think, about an hour and a half in, so between both sessions. So uh, is there any other things that you want to talk? You want to talk about your your uh, land sales business before we get off here? Go ahead and do a shameless plug where people can find you. <laughs> uh, you can. Uh, we can. Um, you can find me on Instagram, uh, Emily Belser Land Agent. Same for Facebook um, if you want to. Uh, 
some inland sales and also doing wildlife consulting. Um, right now I'm licensed in South Carolina for the land sales, looking to get licensed in Georgia um, to expand that a little bit. Um, but I'll take consulting clients. Really, you know, definitely it, the Southeast would be my area of expertise. Mm -hmm. Definitely deer, anything deer related. Um, spent a lot of time studying deer in school. So that's definitely my, uh, my expertise, but Awesome. Well, I'll definitely put your links in the description. So if any of you out there are okay. looking for any type of consulting or land, definitely go hit her up. I appreciate it. Of course. But other than that, for those of y'all that make it to the end, we appreciate y'all walking in. We'll catch y'all next time. This has been Wildlife Outdoors. Thanks for listening. Follow us on Facebook at Wildlife Outdoors and on Instagram at wild.life.outdoors. Let's go live life on the wild side.